Where is Harmony Montgomery? Where is Harmony? When people across this nation, from Florida all the way up to Alaska, and everywhere in between, were looking for Harmony, there's one person who is not. One person. The one person who should have been looking for Harmony was not. Her biological father, that defendant that you saw two days ago, he wasn't looking for her, and in fact, he was hoping that she wouldn't be found. His concern was not with finding this innocent five-year-old girl. His concern was that she would be found, and that his heinous and depraved actions would be brought to light. That's because he was the only person in this world who knows where Harmony is, who knows where her body is, and he was hoping that she would never be found. The one person, the one and only person who murdered Harmony, who butchered her body, and who disposed of her like yesterday's trash. This case is about Harmony Montgomery. I don't want that to get lost as we progress throughout this lengthy trial. This case is about Harmony Montgomery, but it's also about the defendant, his actions, his rage, his brutality, and his escalation in violence. The murder of Harmony Montgomery, that was just the beginning of the depraved actions of this defendant and what this case is all about. It's about a man who, for two years, evaded apprehension, didn't have to answer for his crimes, had no appreciation or concern about Harmony being missing because he already knew she was dead. For two years before the Manchester Police Department initiated their search for Harmony Montgomery, that man got away with murder. His only concern, other than Harmony's body being found, was to keep his wife, Kayla Montgomery, from coming in here and telling you all what he did to her. His heinous actions, his cover-up, what she witnessed. For two years, he got away with butchering a five-year-old girl. And that defendant made sure that Harmony would never be found, that she'd be gone without a trace. You'll see, he believed that if there was no body, there could be no evidence of the horrible things that he did to her, and he would get away with it. And so he went to great lengths to cover up his crime, to cover up beating Harmony to death for a bathroom accident. He went to great lengths to cover up his conduct. Beating Harmony to death because she soiled herself. And he thought that if he destroyed the evidence, what remained of Harmony, if he destroyed Harmony, he could never be charged. He was careless in this meticulous cover-up. He made mistakes. We're going to hear about those mistakes because it's evidence of his crimes. It's evidence of what he did. So let's talk about the evidence in this case. On, November, on December 7th, 2019, the defendant beat Harmony to death because she had a bathroom accident, something she had no control over. She had peed her pants and he murdered her in a series of attacks, of brutal strikes that began that morning in the car that she was living out of and ended in the Burger King parking lot that you all saw yesterday on The View. He carried her body with him for months. For months he carried her body and he discarded her with zero appreciation for the life that he'd taken, just a fear of being caught. And in the months that followed, he beat, he injured, he terrorized the only witness to his crime, the only person that could come in here and tell you what he did. She was his loose end, Kayla Montgomery, his wife. He conditioned Kayla through force and through threats with the purpose of making sure that she would never come in here and tell you 
what she'd seen, what he did, beating Harmony to death for another accident, destroying her body, freezing her, thawing her, squeezing the liquid out of her, compressing her body into a bag like this one. Compressing her body into a bag like this one and filling it with lime to further decompose her. Unspeakable things. And this is what he did to the only witness he left alive. She was beaten, she was conditioned, and she was living in fear. She was in a nightmare with no end while he dragged around Harmony's body for months. And I want to pause here for just a moment. I want to thank all of you for being here. This is going to be a lengthy trial. You're going to hear many difficult things. That's not lost on us. It's not lost on the attorneys that are in this case. So thank you for taking the time out of your lives to come here and listen to the evidence, to judge the evidence. It's necessary. It's a necessary function. And if you listen to the evidence, if you keep an open mind, and if you follow Judge Messer's instructions, you'll understand the timeline of Harmony's death, of the cover-up. You'll understand the horrible things that that defendant did, why he assaulted, why he murdered, why he terrorized, and after he was done with all of this, why he destroyed evidence, why he lied, why he blocked his friends and family, why he manipulated his wife into doing terrible things to hide his crime, to hide the victim that he'd murdered. So let's talk about the victim that he murdered, the, the victim that he made sure couldn't come into this courtroom and tell you the horrible things that he did to her. Her name is Harmony Montgomery. And there are four descriptions that you're going to hear of Harmony during the course of this trial, some of them horrible. Harmony was born to the defendant, Adam Montgomery, and her mother, Crystal Sori. She was born on June 7th of 2014. She was a daughter. She was a sister. She was a Minnie Mouse fan. She was a fun-loving girl that loved being a big sister. She was just five years old when the defendant brutally murdered her. During the course of her, her brief life, she was a, a fun-loving girl. She was someone that defied all odds. She spent most of her life with Tim and Michelle Rafferty, her foster parents, who she called Daddy and Mommy Michelle. And those odds that she defied. When, when Michelle Rafferty, when Tim and Michelle got Harmony, when they got custody of her, she was just two months old. And Michelle was told she's not going to live past seven months, told that she had learning disabilities. And still you'll hear that Harmony was an intelligent girl. She was a curious child. She was a child that ran with other children, played with them. She was potty trained at a very early age. At a very early age, she was potty trained, and that will become important as we progress throughout this trial, so keep that in mind. Harmony was potty trained at a very early age. She wasn't someone that was bound by limitations, and you'll hear that when she lived with her mommy, Michelle, and her mommy, Crystal, she was thriving. She was thriving in school. She was thriving with her peers. She was a child like any other. She was full of life. But that's just one description of Harmony, and I told you there are more. The defendant got custody of Harmony in February of 2019. At, the, at that time, she was only four years old. And the second description is darker. It comes from the 10 days before the defendant murdered her, and we'll talk about that more as we go along. The 10 days 
before he murdered her. In the second description, not the, not the one where Harmony's thriving, in this one, she's scared, she's skinny, she's constantly exhausted, and she's bruised. At this point in Harmony's brief life, she's not able to control her bladder. She's not able to control her bowel movements. She's soiling herself. And during this period, the time when the defendant had her, those 10 days, she went from, from living in their home on Guilford Street at 77 Guilford Street to being homeless and living in, in a car, in the family's car. And when they were living in that car, those bathroom accidents got worse and worse, and they came more and more often. And you'll hear the, about the defendant's rage, this rage of the defendants that was building and building with each and every accident. And each time Harmony had an accident in that 10-day period, the defendant would strike her, that rage only growing, adding to that fear. And the next two descriptions come from the actions that the defendant took, the defendant took after he had murdered Harmony, after he beat her to death. You'll hear that she went from this little girl full of life, a girl that radiated happiness, that radiated joy, to a scared girl, broken, bruised. And from there she went to the dead girl in the duffel bag and after that, she went, to the, she went to the dead girl rotting in the ceiling, the ceiling that the defendant slept under for months. For months, as Harmony's body fluid, her blood leaped, leaked through that duffel bag and was absorbed into that ceiling, he slept under her. That's what he did to her. That's what he made Harmony, his actions. Remember that as we go along. This case is about his actions. And those are the descriptions of Harmony. That's what the defendant made her before he disposed of her. Harmony was just five years old when the defendant beat her to death, but her story continues long after her death with the gruesome actions that the defendant took, the things that he did to her, the places that he took her. Three people witnessed Harmony's death, her murder, and they survived. Her two younger brothers, one just five months old, the other two years old, and her stepmother, Kayla Montgomery. Back then, Kayla was the defendant's wife. She was mother of his two small children, his two boys. They met when they were kids and they married in 2017. And eventually they moved to Manchester, New Hampshire and they lived at the home on 77 Guilford Street. The defendant stayed home with the children and Kayla worked. She was a cashier at Dunkin' Donuts. And during the six months leading up to Harmony's murder, their marriage was on the rocks. But Kayla tried to make it work. She wanted to make it work for her family. She wanted to make it work so that she didn't lose another person that she loved. But this case, it's not about Kayla. It's not about what Kayla did. It's not about what Kayla didn't do. Remember that as we go along. It's about what the defendant did. Kayla was the defendant's loose end. She was the witness to his crimes. She was the witness to his confession to an assault that took place against Harmony by the defendant in July of 2019. She was witness to Harmony's murder. She was witness to the defendant compressing Harmony into bag, smaller bag, smaller bag, compressing her more and more over the months that he had her, adding lime to that bag. And he was witness to, and she was witness to the defendant disposing of Harmony. She was the witness that was left alive. So let's talk about that first event, the assault on Harmony from July of 2019. That summer, the summer of 2019 was Harmony's first time living with the defendant. It was her first summer with the defendant. And again, they lived at this home on Guilford Street. 
you'll hear that they lived there with Helen Montgomery, the defendant's grandmother, and the defendant's uncle, Kevin. And Helen and Kevin left that summer. They went down to Florida. And there, Helen had a triple bypass surgery, and Kevin stayed with her. He accompanied her. He accompanied her to help her in her recovery. And you'll hear that Kevin was gone for three weeks. And when Kevin left, when he left the home, when he left that home, Harmony was uninjured. No bruises. Uninjured. But when he came back, Harmony had a large black eye. A black eye such that was so swollen that the profile of her face had changed. It was horrible. This girl was bruised. She was injured. And her face was swollen. And when Kevin walked through that door, he saw Harmony. And this immediately stood out to him. This was his niece, his great niece. And the defendant was standing next to Harmony. And he said, Harmony, what did you do? What happened to you? And Harmony didn't even have time to answer. The defendant interrupted and said, she didn't do nothing. I bashed her around this house. I beat the dog shit out of her. That's what he told his uncle about Harmony, what happened to her, how she got that injury. I beat her. I did that. The defendant, the defendant in this case. You'll hear that this shocked Kevin. It frightened him. And that was the last night he stayed in the house. He never went back there. He spent that night in his house and he got out of there. And in the time that followed, he did everything he could to get Harmony help. He contacted authorities. He contacted DCYF, contacted child services. You'll hear that he was unsuccessful. This assault from July of 2019 that's separate and apart from the murder charges. <clears throat> Different incident. And so I want to talk about the murder now. And to do that, again, we have to talk about the 10-day period before the defendant brutally murdered Harmony. Those 10 days where Harmony had major life changes. You'll hear that the, the family went from, they went from living they went from living in that home on Guilford Street to being evicted and living in their silver Chrysler Sebring. And while they were living in the Sebring, Harmony's, they were parked. While they were living in the Sebring, they parked in that parking lot we saw yesterday at Colonial Village, the apartments. They stayed there in their car. And Harmony, at this point, had another major life change. She started having accidents. She started peeing herself. She was incontinent. She couldn't control when she had to go to the bathroom. She was peeing herself and she was pooping herself. This girl that, that prided herself on, on being able to control her body, basic functions. She was a big girl, but she started having these, these issues with her bladder, with her, her bowel movements. And you'll hear that when they moved into that vehicle, when they started living there, those accidents got worse and they came more often. She wasn't letting the defendant know when she had to go. And she was creating a mess each time. And that rage, the defendant's rage that you'll hear about in this case, grew and grew. And he would hit her, he would strike her each time she had one of those accidents. And that was Harmony's life for 10 days. For 10 days, she lived in a car. For 10 days, she had bathroom accidents. For 10 days, she was unable to control her own body. For 10 days, she was in fear. She was scared because each time she had one of these accidents, the defendant would hit her. The defendant that you saw two days ago, a large man, he would hit this she was 35 pounds in June of 2019. This again is in December. She was tiny and he would hit her. He would strike her with a fist over something she had no control over. And those accidents were getting worse and they were coming more often. 
and she was so bruised before her murder that the defendant had to hide her when he went out in public. He would literally take a blanket and cover her up so that she couldn't be seen and that so no one would know what he had done to her. No one would see those bruises. And that brings us to December 7th of 2019. That day began like any other day for Harmony. They were living in that car. She woke up and she was scared. She was scared because she'd, she'd wet herself. She didn't want the defendant to know. She'd wet herself first thing that morning and she was afraid. And just as she feared what happened, the defendant smelled what she had done. And for that, he hit her. He struck her in the face and he drove his car. He continued on with his day as if he had done nothing. He struck this little girl in her face on the side of her head and he continued on as if nothing happened. He drove to the methadone clinic, the clinic that you saw yesterday on The View. And there he and Kayla took turns getting their treatment. You'll hear that Kayla went in first, the defendant stayed in the car, and then the defendant went in. And when the defendant came back to the car, he was hungry. And so he started driving the, the family's car to the Burger King, the Burger King that you saw yesterday on The View. And as he was pulling out of that parking lot, he smelled something. He smelled that Harmony had had another accident. And that rage, that rage that had build, been building inside of him, it was there. Remember, he was still upset about the earlier accident, that first thing in the morning. And he looked back at Harmony as he was driving. And he said, really, Harmony, again? And he began striking her. As he was driving, holding onto the wheel, he began punching this little girl repeatedly, repeatedly for something she had no control over. He struck her blow after blow after blow to the side of her small head. And he didn't stop. And you'll hear me say that. He didn't stop. He didn't stop with that first barrage of assaults, of strikes to her small head. He continued. And when he pulled up to a light, he continued hitting her, hit after hit to her small head, blow after blow. Now, during this barrage of strikes, Kayla, who was in the passenger seat, seated next to the defendant, seated in front of Harmony, she put a hand up. She tried to block what this defendant was doing to Harmony. She tried to stop him. You'll hear that in that moment, he looked at her as if to say, you're next. And she was scared. And she looked forward and she put her hand down and those strikes to Harmony continued. And when he pulled up to another light as he was driving to that Burger King parking lot, he continued striking her. And after that last strike, he looked at Kayla and he said, I think I really hurt her this time, this time. I think I really hurt her this time. I think I did something. And he didn't stop. He continued with his drive, pulled into that parking lot at Burger King, and he ordered his food. He ordered his food and he ate. He didn't stop to check on Harmony he didn't look back at her. He didn't show any concern for this innocent little girl, the child he'd just beaten. He ordered his food and he ate and he didn't stop. You'll hear that at that time, after that last blow, after that last strike to her small head, she began moaning, <coughs> making a gurgling sound sounds that continued on and off for several minutes. And he didn't show any concern, ate his food, and he continued driving towards the Colonial apartment parking lot. 
And while he was there, he did drugs for 20 to 25 minutes, showing no concern for the child that was dying in his back seat, just feet away from him. And Kayla, you'll hear, was too scared to look back. She couldn't look back. She was frozen. She was terrified to see what he had done to this small child. She could just hear that moaning, those gargling sounds, sounds that eventually stopped. After the defendant ordered his food and he was driving back, he did his drugs, listening to those noises, not showing any concern. He pulled into the Colonial Village parking lot and he did drugs for 20 to 25 minutes. He ate his food and he did his drugs and Harmony slowly died. And when he was done with that, still showing no concern for Harmony, he pulled out of the parking lot where they'd been living. And when he made it to the intersection of Webster and Elm, which you saw in the view yesterday, his car died. It died just as Harmony had died several minutes before. The defendant realized they were gonna have to abandon that vehicle. And so he started removing items, getting the kids out, shaking Harmony, telling her to wake up. She wasn't responding. She couldn't, she was dead. He had done that. And when he realized that Harmony was no longer alive, that he'd murdered her, he grabbed a duffel bag. Remember, they were living in that car. All of their items, all of their possessions were in that car. He grabbed the duffel bag and he stuffed Harmony's body inside. And remember those descriptions that I told you about, about Harmony, what you'd hear throughout this trial. That's when Harmony became the dead girl in the duffel bag. He did that to her. That's what he made her. The defendant stuffed her into that bag and he went on about his day as if nothing happened. But Harmony's murder, that was only the beginning. And remember what I told you, this case, it's about the actions of the defendant. They didn't stop after he murdered Harmony. That was the beginning of his conduct. His actions didn't end when he brutally murdered Harmony. You'll hear about how he carried her for months, scheming, plotting, coming up with a plan of how to get rid of Harmony somewhere she would never be found. And they went back to the Colonial Village parking lot that afternoon. They had a friend there, a friend who, who let them stay in his, his Audi. And you'll hear that that friend brought, brought them dinner for two nights, the two nights they stayed there, December 7th and 8th. He brought them dinner and notably, he didn't see Harmony with them. He didn't see Harmony because she was in that duffel bag, the duffel bag that he was moving between the trunk of that Audi SUV and the ground outside. At night, he would keep her in the ground between his car, the Audi SUV, and the dumpsters that you saw yesterday that you walked around in that parking lot. He kept her on the ground because it was cold outside. Remember, this was in December, and he wanted to keep her body cold. <laughs> From the Colonial Village parking lot, they went to Kayla's mother's home, and they stayed there for the rest of the month. She picked them up in her, her van, and that's where Harmony stayed for several days while the defendant looked for somewhere more suitable to keep her. And he found something more suitable. In the entryway of Christina Lubin, Kayla's mother's home, he found this open cooler. And he stored her there for much of the remainder of his stay. And they left that home on December 30th, and they went to the Families in Transition shelter. It was at the Families in Transition shelter that the defendant began to discuss disposing of Harmony, getting rid of her. He believed, you'll hear, he believed that if there was no body to find, 
there would be no evidence of what he'd done and he would get away with this heinous crime. And so he began to discuss disposing of her. While he was there, he moved Harmony from the closet of that room. He moved her to the ceiling. He removed that vent cover and he stuffed her body inside. And that's when Harmony became the dead girl rotting in the ceiling, the ceiling that he slept under for months. Now, the defendant faced another problem at the fit shelter. Harmony's body began to rot. It began to smell. He was storing her body in the ceiling above his room, and the heat was on. And the heat was causing her body to decompose more and more by the day, to rot more and more by the day. And it was smelling. And other tenants, other people that lived there were complaining about those smells. So he had to take her body out of that ceiling. And he brought it to the bathroom, and he compressed it. He, he compressed and contorted her body into this bag, into a bag like this. And he put it back up there, back in the ceiling. And when he was taking her body down, when it was still in the duffel bag before he'd added trash bags and put her inside a bag like this one, she was leaking. She was leaking. Her liquids were pouring through that duffel bag. And investigators followed up with the fit shelter. They went to that room. They looked in the ceiling. And when they took that vent cover off, they immediately smelled decompos deco decomposition, a smell associated with dead bodies, rotting bodies. They smelled decomp. Still present two years after the defendant had removed Harmony's body from the ceiling. And they saw deep stains, deep stains in the drywall where Harmony's blood had been absorbed. <laughs> that blood was tested. It was sent to a lab in Florida and tested. And that lab in Florida confirmed that that blood was Harmony. Something the defendant missed. Remember, he was careless in his meticulous cover-up. He made mistakes. That's going to be one of them. That blood in the ceiling, Harmony's blood in the ceiling, all that remained of Harmony. The defendant made sure of that. And surrounding that blood, surrounding this blood, surrounding what was left of Harmony, the defendant's fingerprints, his palm prints, frozen there for time. So at the shelter, the defendant had a problem. He was living in a shelter. He didn't have access to a freezer. And Harmony's body was beginning to rot and stink. And it was getting worse and worse by the day. People were complaining. This wasn't good for him. And it was around this time he started working at the Portland Pie Company, which used to be here in town, since closed. He worked there for just over a month. He was a dishwasher and a cook. And that CMC bag, the one that looked like this, that accompanied him to work. It stood out to people because he placed it in the freezer during his shifts. He brought it with him regularly to work and he stored it in a freezer where the company kept food, ingredients. People saw him bringing that in and out regularly. They couldn't have imagined what that bag contained, but they saw it. And after they left the fit shelter, after the defendant left the shelter, he moved into an apartment on Union Street. And it was in the Union Street apartment that he began to discuss, he began to discuss dismembering Harmony, squishing her, further contorting her body. He discussed using a saw to cut her up. 
he discussed using lime to further decompose her so that there would be nothing to find. Remember, he believed that if there was no body, there could be no evidence, and he would get away with this horrible thing that he'd done, beating this little girl to death. And it was in the bathroom of his Union Street apartment that he compressed Harmony. Already in that CMC bag, filling that CMC bag, he compressed her further, and he added lime to the bag, thinking that it would eat away at anything left of her. He spent most of the day in that bathroom compressing Harmony. He took her out of the CMC bag and he placed her in the tub. She was frozen at that point, so he turned the hot water on and ran it over her so that he could manipulate her body, further compress her. Kayla walked into the bathroom as he was doing this. She saw what he was doing. She saw Harmony. Harmony, at that point, was skin and bones. And she saw the defendant squeezing Harmony, squishing Harmony, trying to remove the liquids that remained from her small body and down the drain of the tub. When Kayla walked into that bathroom, he told her to help him. You'll hear that that Kayla obeyed. She held Harmony's arm while the defendant used his scissors to cut off Harmony's clothes. But this was too much for Kayla. She couldn't take what she was seeing, what the defendant was doing, the sick and grotesque things that he was doing to this child's body. And so she went to the living room to be with her two sons to make sure that they didn't walk in and see what he was doing. So in that bathroom, the defendant shut the door be behind her. <clears throat> At once bulging CMC bag, the bag that Harmony's body filled, he compressed. He compressed it enough to add much of a 40 pound bag of lime. And he took breaks from the horror show in that bathroom. And during one of the breaks, breaks from working on Harmony's body, he said, I can put her in pieces. I can put her in pieces, I can cut her up. And while he was working in that bathroom, working on Harmony, he clogged the drain. Remember that as we go along, he clogged the drain. While he was squeezing her, getting the liquids out, he clogged the drain to the bathroom. And investigators learned that the defendant went to Home Depot on February 26, just six days after they moved into that apartment. He went to Home Depot where he bought a saw a backup saw blade, diamond cutting saw blade, a backup battery, and line. That was on February 26th, just six days after he moved into that, that apartment. On February 27th, he placed a work order to unclog his drain. Now, it was around this time that the defendant began to suspect that Kayla was working with the police, trying to give them evidence to put him away for what he'd done to Harmony. He was suspicious of her and he was pulling out outlets. He was pulling out light bulbs, light sockets, thinking that there were listening devices planted to get him for what he'd done to Harmony. And it was around this time that he started beating Kayla he started threatening her, threatening her that if she reported him, he would kill her. And that if he went to jail for what he did, he'd have someone else kill her. The abuse was constant and it came regularly and Kayla documented the abuse as shown here. Less than a week after the horror show in that Union Street apartment bathroom, the defendant disposed of what remained of Harmony, what was left of her. He was meticulous in making sure that nothing came back on him. He elicited help from friends. He asked a friend to get him a U-Haul van. A U-Haul van back then was cheaper than a rental car. You'll hear that this friend, he helped. He got him the van. The defendant at the time rented a hotel room so that he could leave the hotel room and dispose of Harmony. And when that friend 
when he came to bring the defendant the keys to the van with his girlfriend, his girlfriend saw a CMC bag, a CMC bag that was protruding from the hotel room's mini fridge, and that stood out to her. And when the friend gave the defendant the keys to that U-Haul van, the defendant said, I fucked up, I fucked up, and he repeated it over and over, I fucked up, I, me, the defendant, I fucked up. But he couldn't say how. He couldn't say what he'd done to fuck up. That was on March 3rd of 2020. The defendant left in the middle of the night, headed south. And when the defendant left, he told Kayla that he wasn't gonna tell her where he was gonna dump Harmony, where he was gonna dispose of her. He didn't want her to have that information that he could later, that she could later use against him. He was in control. He had all the pieces. He wasn't gonna have someone know where evidence of the girl that he had brutally beaten was. He made sure that he was the only person that knew what he'd done with her. Remember, he believed that if there was no body, he could never be charged. He could never be charged with this heinous crime. And when he left the hotel room that night, he headed south to Mass, and he made another mistake. That U-Haul van that he rented, he blew through tolls on the Tobin Bridge, and a camera captured that van. You'll hear about the, the many searches for Harmony Montgomery involving multiple states, Maine, Mass, New Hampshire, involving multiple agencies, both state and federal. Thousands of man hours looking for this little girl. And you'll hear the defendant's words. You'll hear him on a recorded call during one of those searches telling his friend that investigators were wasting their time, wasting their time looking for this little girl that he brutally murdered. They were wasting their time. The defendant's words, you'll hear that. After disposing of Harmony, the defendant realized he, made, he had one loose end, his wife, Kayla. And so he conditioned her. The abuse got worse over those months and months. He beat her. She was a loose end to him and nothing more. Now, you'll hear that Kayla lied. She stuck to a story that the defendant gave her. She was scared at what would happen to her at the hands of the man she witnessed beat this small child to death and drag her body around for months. She's gone to prison for those lies. She's gone to prison for those lies. And since then, she's helped investigators. She's helped investigators find proof, proof that Harmony is dead, that blood, in the ceiling with the defendant's fingerprints. She spoke to investigators and police for hours upon hours over multiple days. Statements that gave investigators evidence that they wouldn't have without her. Gave a mother some sense of closure, knowing that her daughter's dead, still out there somewhere, but not suffering, not anymore. Now, Kayla's testimony is important. She saw what happened, she felt it, she lived it, she's still living it. But the reason you only have one witness to the defendant's crime is because he killed the other, the witness that he couldn't control, the witness that he couldn't manipulate. But even though Kayla's testimony is important, this case doesn't rest solely on her shoulders. You're gonna hear about the forensic evidence, the physical evidence that corroborates what she says about the surveillance footage. You'll hear and see evidence that corroborates Kayla in ways that she never could have imagined. You'll hear and see evidence that shows you who killed Harmony, who had motive to destroy her after he killed her. And you'll hear some of the defendant's lies for yourself. You'll hear about the absurd story he told to evade apprehension that he gave Harmony back to her, her mother in mass the day before Thanksgiving in 2019. That was his excuse. That was his lie. But in those two years where he didn't have to answer for this crime, 
where he thought he was free and clear of what he'd done, he told someone that he trusted what he really thought of Harmony. He told her that she was evil, that she did evil things. He told her that Harmony was a constant reminder of her mother, Crystal Sori, who he hated. And he told her that he hated Harmony to his core. That's what he said in secret about the innocent child that he'd beaten to death. The helpless girl that he beat because she soiled herself. He hated Harmony to his core, and the evidence is gonna show that he did everything to destroy Harmony after he beat her, to hide his crime, to hide evidence of what he'd done. And for what the defendant did, he's, char he's been charged with multiple crimes, crimes that the clerk read to you yesterday in open court. And the evidence will prove that he's guilty of each and every one of them. He's guilty of the second degree assault for beating Harmony in that July 2019 incident, for bashing her around the house, for beating her off every wall in the house, for kicking the dog shit out of her, for causing the black eye, causing that injury to Harmony. Just like he's guilty of reckless second degree murder for beating Harmony to death in the Chrysler Sebring on December 7th, 2019. He's guilty of falsifying physical evidence for mutilating Harmony's corpse, for destroying her, for putting her somewhere she would never be found. And he's guilty of tampering with a witness for beating Kayla, for threatening her, for compelling her to stick to the story that he gave her. And he's guilty of abuse of a corpse for his conduct in the Union Street apartment bathroom for compressing Harmony into that small bag, adding lime to it. Those are the crimes the defendant in this case committed. That's what he's guilty of. The defendant committed multiple violent crimes against a small child, a helpless child. In December 2019, he assaulted and he murdered because of that rage, his rage. He destroyed Harmony so that he could never be caught. And he beat Kayla for control. That's what the defendant did to his victim in this case. And at the conclusion of this trial, that's what we'll ask you to find him guilty of.